Humanity has assigned supernatural abilities to precious stones from the time that the first primitive people discovered and worshipped the glittering pebbles that we now call jewels. Legends from the ancient past describe how precious stones cast their spell over mankind. One ancient Persian creation myth gives a vital role to gems in the story of the Garden of Eden and the temptations of Satan. Satan was watching people trying to figure out how he could get weapons over the human race. And one of the things he noticed was how tempted people were by the colors of the flowers. So he tried to duplicate the colors of the flowers out of Earth and thus created gemstones. Whether they were considered a force for good or evil, gems were assigned magical properties when worn as talismans, ranging from healing energy to deadly curses. When you look at gems as talismans, the the qualities, the obvious qualities of these gems generally lend a great deal of color to what they're used for as talismans. So the diamond has two major qualities that jump out at you. It's clear, and so it's associated with purity. And it's the hardest uh, element known to us, so it's also associated with strength, with protection. Throughout the medieval and renaissance world, the diamond was prized as a gem with a power to heal. The 15th century Italian doctor, Camillus Leopardus, ascribed strange medicinal abilities to diamonds. Could this stone possess the power to heal? The diamond is a help to lunatics, and such as are possessed with the devil. It gives victory over enemies. It tames wild beasts. It helps those who are troubled with phantoms and the nightmare. And it makes him that wears it bold and daring in his transactions. Camillus Leopardus, 15th century. It was also believed that this most precious of gems possessed powers for evil as well as good. In the Middle Ages, diamonds were regarded as the deadliest poison on earth. Renaissance princess Catherine de' Medici, renowned for her patronage of the arts and notorious for her political manipulations, reportedly used diamond powder to poison her family's rivals to the throne. Modern science, however, has shown that there is nothing intrinsically poisonous about the gem. Swallowing diamond dust would be no more harmful than eating sand. Nevertheless, this sinister myth became accepted fact in the ancient world. Tales of the poisonous effects of diamonds may well have originated in India nearly 3,000 years ago. Scholars believe that the owners of ancient gem mines fabricated the story of the jewel's deadly properties in order to prevent workers from stealing diamonds by swallowing them. The glorious Hope Diamond itself must have originated in India, for until the mid-19th century, all the diamonds in the world had come from the mining pits of the Punjab.
Diamonds were being mined in India as long ago as 800 years before the birth of Jesus. The gem was so highly prized that Indian diamond merchants counted as their customers the Caesars of Rome and the emperors of China. By the 17th century, Indian mining towns were among the wealthiest cities in the world. Yet the allegedly lethal powers of the Hope Diamond seem to extend far beyond its supposedly poisonous effects. For legend asserts that merely being in the presence of the splendid blue jewel may cause chaos, ruin, and death. According to tradition, the curse of the Hope Diamond originated in 17th century India during the reign of the Mughal emperors. On a sweltering evening during monsoon season, a French adventurer by the name of Jean-Baptiste Tavernier begged for shelter at a remote Hindu temple. The center of worship for the temple was an enormous jewel-covered statue of a Hindu god. The god's all-seeing eyes were fashioned from huge diamonds of the darkest and rarest blue, each of them weighing over 100 carats. Late that night, Tavernier crept into the inner sanctum of the temple, intent on stripping the god of its treasures. But at the very moment the Frenchman pried out the first glittering diamond eye, he was discovered by one of the temple priests. Pursued by the enraged holy man, Tavernier barely escaped from the temple with his life. But he clutched in his hand a glittering prize, the largest blue diamond in the history of the world. The Hope Diamond is supposed to have been the eye of an idol. And such stones, if stolen from their original owners, were inevitably supposed to be cursed. Um, rather like the curse of King Tut throughout history, sacred things put to profane uses have always brought horror and harm to the, uh, to the profaner. Does the curse of the Hope Diamond originate with this shadowy tale of ancient India? The source of the Hope Diamond is the first big mystery because we don't know positively where it did come from. They have said that the, that the Hope was an idol's eye, but in all candor, I think they say that about almost any old historic diamond. Uh, I think it's extremely unlikely the cut of the Hope isn't appropriate for an idol's eye. The Hope Diamond probably was found in the early 1600s. We know that the diamond was eventually acquired by Jean-Baptiste Tavernet, who was a well-known gem merchant at that time. We're not sure where he acquired it, whether he got it in India or whether he bought it somewhere else. However Tavernier acquired the diamond, we can trace its journey simply by following the trail of death and disaster it left behind. The extraordinary blue diamond that would later be called the Hope possesses a curse that is at least three centuries old. Who was Jean-Baptiste Tavernier, the first recorded owner of the fabled diamond? Tavernier had a paradoxical reputation as both a pillar of society and a greedy scoundrel. Mm -hmm. 
Tavernier traveled the world and became the premier diamond merchant of Europe and Asia in the 17th century. His fame was such that the king of Persia awarded him a title, jeweler in ordinary, a rank which entitled him to wear the lavish turban and robe of Persian nobility. In 1642, Tavernier first recorded his possession of an incredible blue diamond. At an astonishing 112 carats, it was nearly the size of a man's fist. But for some unknown reason, Tavernier's usually precise records never mention how he came to acquire the extraordinary gem. Tavernier was a man of great integrity. Tavernier would not have taken the diamond because he was honest, and I think there's proof of that. So that the only way he could have taken it was to have paid the local prince for it. And then in fact, one of the things he's commended for is that when they had local taxes on stones, he always paid the tax. All that is certain is that, somehow, Jean-Baptiste Tavernier had come into possession of one of the most extraordinary diamonds in the history of the world. Then he made the momentous decision to leave India and bring the diamond to Europe, possibly unleashing a powerful and deadly curse. For no sooner had the gem merchant arrived in France in 1645 than he was summoned to show his wares before the mighty King Louis XIV. Louis had dubbed himself the Sun King, a fitting title, for he was the most powerful monarch in Europe, his glittering court at Versailles the envy of the world. He was also obsessed with gems, and his unlimited wealth allowed him to indulge his extravagant tastes. A single royal coat from his lavish wardrobe glittered with 123 diamond buttons and 396 jeweled buttonholes. Tavernier's arrival from the diamond mines of India instantly caught the attention of this king with a passion for jewels. Upon seeing Tavernier's treasure trove, Louis XIV immediately bought 44 large diamonds and more than a thousand smaller diamonds. But for the king, one jewel outshone all the others. To the dazzled monarch, the great blue diamond was a treasure beyond price. The king paid Tavernier the princely sum of 220,000 livres, the equivalent of $75,000 today. To further express his gratitude to Tavernier, the king granted him a title of nobility. Suddenly, with the sale of his most precious jewel, Tavernier rose from an itinerant merchant to a prosperous aristocrat. But no sooner had Tavernier left the royal court of France than the curse of the Hope Diamond seemingly began to take its dreaded effect. Tavernier's nephew defrauded him of his entire fortune in gems, according to legend. Destitute, the broken and aging Tavernier returned to India 
in a last desperate attempt to rebuild his fortune. According to the tale, he died a grisly death in the Indian desert, torn apart by a pack of wild dogs. Although these accounts were widely believed, Tavernier's body was never recovered. The facts behind Tavernier's disappearance would not be revealed for over a hundred years. It was not until 1875 that researchers discovered in an obscure graveyard the actual tomb of Jean-Baptiste Tavernier. The great gem merchant had not perished in an Indian wasteland. He had died in Russia, in the heart of Moscow, and far from being a broken man, Tavernier had in fact lived a long and prosperous life. Despite the surprising truth about Tavernier's final destiny, the curse of the Hope Diamond seemed to wreak havoc on its new owners, the royal family of France. By the 1700s, the crown jewels of France were considered the most fabulous gem collection in the world, thanks in no small part to the glorious blue diamond. But no sooner had Louis XIV acquired the blue diamond from Tavernier than the king suffered a slow and agonizing death from gangrene. A result, it was said, of the curse of the blue diamond. His heir, Louis XV, passed the deadly gem to his own grandson when he died in 1774. Tragically, the new king also seemed to have inherited the Blue Diamond's deadly legacy. Louis and his young Austrian wife, Marie Antoinette, seemed more concerned with the latest fashions and the scandalous gossip of the court than they were about politics or the starving masses. An avid collector of jewels, Marie Antoinette's favorite gem was the magnificent Great Blue Diamond, which legend says she flaunted at royal balls and intimate soirees. But did Marie Antoinette ever really wear the Hope Diamond herself? There's absolutely no evidence to show that Marie Antoinette ever wore the Hope Diamond. It was put into an insignia that was only worn by the king. As far as the Hope Diamond is concerned, it's up to you whether you decide that it's bad luck, good luck, or has brings any luck at all. But if you're going to reach some conclusion, please, please base it on a true story. Uh, don't, for example, say that Marie Antoinette had bad luck because she wore the diamond when she didn't. Whether or not Marie Antoinette wore the Hope Diamond, it seemed as if the blue jewel was an outward metaphor for the greed and avarice that led to the royal family's downfall. July 14, 1789, an angry Parisian mob stormed the French prison called the Bastille. The French Revolution had begun.
wealthy aristocrats suddenly found themselves on trial for crimes against the people. A new and fearsome invention, the guillotine, would soon prove its grim effectiveness in separating the French nobility from their fortunes and their heads. Sensing mortal danger, the king and Marie Antoinette fled the palace of Versailles under cover of darkness. They took with them only their most cherished possessions, including the great blue diamond. Within a day, they were captured and placed under arrest. In 1793, Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI of France marched up the steps to the guillotine before a vengeful mob of thousands. The necks that had once worn the magnificent blue diamond now felt the deadly kiss of the guillotine's blade. Yet even as Marie Antoinette's head rolled, the strange saga of the Hope Diamond was far from over. For with the Hope Diamond and the crown jewels now in the hands of the French National Assembly, the story of the Great Blue Diamond would take an even more bizarre turn. The crown jewels and were put into a building that was translated as a furniture warehouse. And they had a number of the jewels in several rooms. A man who was in prison heard about the warehouse and he recruited a lot of other people to join him in robbing the crown jewels. The aftermath of all this is a little bit like a musical comedy or something because they robbed the jewels over a six day period. And at times they had they invited their girlfriends in and had a picnic while they were there. By the time the Parisian police learned of the crime, the crown jewels of France, the greatest gem collection in all of Europe had disappeared without a trace. Swept up in the reign of terror following the French Revolution and the execution of King Louis XVI, the great blue diamond of the crown vanished from sight. And yet, despite its disappearance, its sinister legend was far from over. Twenty years after the French Revolution, in 1813, a much smaller blue diamond turned up in an obscure London jewelry store. Though differing in size and shape, the gem's color was the same deep, rich hue as the great blue diamond of France. Was this the same rare jewel recut to disguise its source? Most experts agree that the striking similarities between the two stones must certainly be more than just coincidence. The logical reasons that one can state that make you believe that the hope really came from the French blue are just that there are not many blue diamonds in the first place. There are not many dark blue diamonds, or even fewer dark blue diamonds that are that big. Yet if the Hope Diamond was carved from the body of the French blue, what happened to the 22 carats carved from the original stone to create the 45 carat Hope Diamond?
Are there other smaller stones cut from the giant blue diamond of the French crown? The biggest mystery of the Hope Diamond, it would seem to me, if there is a curse. What happened to the rest of Tavernier Blue? If there are one or two other stones, are they similarly cursed? If other Tavernier Blue stones exist, have they too brought misfortune and horror to their eyes? If so, which has certainly shed a lot more credence on the notion that uh, the Hope Diamond is cursed. Some experts believe that the missing jewels will never be found. The diamond was recut uh, between 1792 and 1812, and it was cut from 67 carats down to the present 45 and a half carats. The shape of the French blue at that time and the current Hope Diamond pretty much preclude having had any other diamond cut from it. It would have been lost during the cutting process, and unfortunately then is, is lost forever. It is at this crucial juncture, the diamond said to carry the curse would now, ironically, take on the name of Hope. In 1830, British aristocrat Henry Philip Hope, heir to a banking fortune, purchased the blue diamond from a London gem merchant for $90,000, the equivalent of $1.5 million today. He died childless, his fortune inherited by his nephew, Henry Thomas Hope, who died suddenly as well. In 1887, Lord Francis Henry Hope became the sole owner of the Hope Diamond and heir to the Hope family's fabulous wealth. He seems to have been a gambler and someone who frequently was short of money. While he was single, he went to a music hall in England and saw May Yoy who was an American singer. He was captivated by her. He went to every time she performed and sat and watched her. In 1894, Madcap May Yoy, as the press called her, was as famous for her notorious offstage escapades as she was for her onstage roles. Despite their difference in social class, Lord Hope and the young singer became engaged. The aristocratic groom bestowed the Hope Diamond on the chorus girl as her wedding present. Could true love triumph over the fabled curse? It was not to be. Within a year of his wedding, Lord Hope was bankrupt. A year after that, Madcap May left her husband. Financially and emotionally devastated, Lord Hope sold the dazzling blue diamond he had given to his bride for a sum of $140,000, the equivalent of nearly $2 million today. The flamboyant May Yoy became so obsessed with the infamous gem that despite her divorce from Lord Hope, she wore a replica of the Hope Diamond for the rest of her career. Tragically, the curse seemed to cast its shadow across her life as well. For when she founded a hotel she named the Blue Diamond, it burned to the ground within months of opening. When May Yoy died in 1938, the woman who once owned the Hope Diamond was on government relief, earning a mere $16 a week. Whether the curse of the Hope Diamond destroyed generations of the Hope family, or if the string of disasters that befell them was simply a matter of coincidence, is open to interpretation. 
If you ask me that question straight out, is there a curse on the Hope Diamond, I would hem and I would haw. And I would say, well, perhaps it's coincidence. Uh, remember that uh, precious gems carry with them a great deal of temptation to steal. The sort of people who can generally afford to own such things very often have difficult private lives. I could tell you all sorts of things like that. If you ask me would I like it for a Christmas gift, I'd say no. For the three centuries of its recorded existence, the Hope Diamond shimmered like a sinister omen, a jewel with a trail of death in its wake. As the 20th century began, the legend of the Hope Diamond continued to cast its spell over all who came in contact with it. Yet scholars today believe that surprisingly, the entire legend of the Hope Diamond's curse may be traced to a single man. His name was Pierre Cartier, and though a jeweler by trade, his dramatic flair for showmanship may have created one of the most enduring myths in history. Cartier acquired the Hope Diamond in 1908. He planned to sell the fabled gem to his most eccentric client. Evelyn Walsh McLean was the pampered daughter of a wealthy Colorado gold miner. Her extravagant wedding to newspaper tycoon Thomas McLean was the talk of Washington, D.C. In 1909, the newlyweds traveled to Paris to purchase a wedding present at Pierre Cartier's jewelry establishment. We're not sure how much Pierre Cartier himself had to do with really creating the story of a curse on the Hope Diamond, but clearly he was interested in selling this diamond to Evelyn Walsh McLean. He was aware that she was interested in stones that had a bit of history. She's also been quoted as having said that stones that were gems that were bad luck for other people were good luck for her. She was flamboyant. She said in her biography that she would gladly have hung by her heels from the top of the building or something. She had thought it would cause attention. Historians believe Cartier was the first person to claim that the Hope Diamond was pried from the eye of a stone idol. It was Cartier who first told the story of the diamond's discoverer, Jean-Baptiste Tavernier, being torn apart by wild dogs. And it was Cartier who first claimed that the Hope Diamond was worn by Marie Antoinette before her beheading. Apparently, Cartier's consummate salesmanship had the desired effect. In 1911, Evelyn Walsh McLean bought the Hope Diamond for $180,000, the equivalent of $3 million today. So it seems that that had to be the, the origin of the story of the curse, because we don't really have any documentation that, that speaks of a curse any earlier than that. The tale continued to grow, for Mrs. McLean herself helped enhance the diamond's bizarre reputation. She flaunted her disdain for the diamond's legendary curse in the most outrageous ways, keeping it under the pillows of her couch and even mounting it on a collar for her dog. Tragically, Evelyn McLean herself would seemingly fall victim to the very curse she had dared to embrace. Mrs. McLean's eldest son was killed in a car accident when he was nine years old. Her husband became an alcoholic and died in a mental institution. And her only daughter committed suicide by a drug overdose at age 25. 
A broken woman, Mrs. McLean herself died less than a year later. Is the tragic fate of Mrs. McLean and her family only a bizarre coincidence? Or when Cartier invented the tale of the Hope Diamond's curse, did it contain more truth than he ever knew? I just don't believe that it was the Hope that did that. Uh, I think that the same things would have happened to them in any event. And some of the things that they say were caused by the Hope Diamond were things that happened before she ever had the Hope Diamond. With Evelyn McLean's death in 1947, her heirs sold the diamond which had obsessed her to the renowned New York jeweler, Harry Winston. Winston publicly denied the existence of the curse. In 1958, he donated the Hope Diamond to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. The world's most fabulous and most feared diamond now belonged to the American people. But when the gem went to the Smithsonian, did the curse go with it? Since 1958, it's been in the hands of the Smithsonian Institution, it's been uh, in the hands of the people of the United States, and some might claim that we've had a lot of trouble since 1958. I've actually, uh, actually read in one, one place the uh, claim made that uh, everything from the Vietnam War to the Kennedy assassination can be laid at its nefarious doorstep. What is it about this sparkling piece of blue stone that spawns dark legends of chaos and destruction, even as it touches the hearts of millions? Perhaps our need to believe in the ancient curse is as old as the human imagination. Curses certainly answer a lot of questions. There are a lot of things that happen in human life, a lot of patterns that we cannot explain. The curse cer certainly takes the guesswork out of a lot of these things. Uh, if the Hope Diamond has no curse, if these are simply random things, it makes life a lot more difficult to understand. The human mind hates disorder. I think probably as long as there are gems and as long as there are unpleasant patterns in life, we will have cursed gems. Beautiful, yet seemingly deadly, flawless, yet apparently cursed. Perhaps it is this forbidden attraction that makes the curse of the Hope Diamond such a haunting, seductive story. Whether the tale is true or not is less important than the effect the story has had on succeeding generations for over three centuries. The legend of the mysterious Hope Diamond endures with the strength and dazzling fire of the diamond itself, enticing those of us who dare to go in search of history.